Hello, everybody, and welcome to another one of my favorite short stories. It's called Luella Miller. It was written by Mary Wilkins Freeman. Uh, in 1902, it was published, and as usual, I'm going to read the first couple of pages. I'm going to give you hints and clues, what I think is happening already, kind of open and introduce it to you, and then your job will be to finish the rest of the story by yourself and to decide whether or not it is a vampire story, uh, and give, of course, three reasons to support your three quotes and reasons to support your answer or your idea. Um, know that this is about a 13 or 14 page short story. It reads pretty easily. It's just somebody telling a story. Uh, I'll read the first two or three pages and then you're gonna pick it up from there and finish it this afternoon, this evening. Um, I do wanna point out one thing though. I don't know where we are in our search as far as if we have done types of vampires yet, but I just want you to keep that in your mind while you're reading this story types of vampires, that there are different types of vampires who feed in different ways. I don't know if it'll have anything to do with this story, <laughs> but just keep that in mind. Okay, let's go. Mary Wilkins Freeman, Luella Miller. Close to the village street stood the one-story house in which Luella Miller, who had an evil name in the village, had dwelt. I'm underlining that sucker right away. Who had an evil name in the village. Does that necessarily mean vampiric? No, but it's certainly not a good start for Luella Miller. She had been dead for years, yet there were those in the village who, in spite of the clearer light which comes on a vantage point from a long past danger, half believed in the tale which they had heard from their childhood. Okay, that's interesting. So she's been dead a long time, but the old people of the town are still afraid of this woman and her story. Let's, let's hear this story. In their hearts, although they scarcely would have owned it, was a survival of the wild horror and frenzied fear of their ancestors who had dwelt in the same age with Luella Miller. Wild horror and frenzied fear, all right? So even though she's been dead a while, the people generations later still feel in their hearts the wild horror and frenzied fear of their ancestors of the people who did live with Luella Miller. Dag, something's wrong with Luella Miller or was, let's find out. Young people even would stare with a shudder at the old house as they passed, and children never played around it as was their wont around an untended building. Not a window in the old Miller house was broken. The panes reflected the morning sunlight in patches of emerald and blue, and the latch of the sagging front door was never lifted, although no bolt secured it. So this is interesting. You've got this old house that's been there for generations. None of the windows are broken because none of the kids will go and vandalize this building because they're so afraid of it, which says something. Also, nobody goes in and hangs out, squats in the building, has a party in the building with their friends, goes in and screws around, even goes in on like a dare. Uh, if you saw Monster House, you know what I'm talking about, right? That they'll even, kids will dare other kids to go up and touch stuff like that. No, no one goes near this home. Since Luella Miller had been carried out of it, the house had had no tenant except one friendless old soul had no choice between that and the far off shelter of the open sky. So they said since Luella Miller had been carried out of it, all right, so to carry a woman out of her house probably means only one thing, that she died in the house and then they were, the, the people came in and carried her out of it. And they say only one person went into that house since then because they had nowhere else to go. I guess it was a homeless person. Let's find out what happened to them. This woman, who had survived her kindred and friends, lived in the house one week. Then one morning, no smoke came out of the chimney, and a body of neighbors, a score strong, entered and found her dead in her bed. So I'm writing that. I'm, I'm underlining this, by the way. After one week, only one week, they entered and found her dead in her bed. And a score of neighbors, a score is 20, 20 people went in to find her. I bet you they would not go in with any less because they're all afraid of going in. Why did they go in, by the way? Because no smoke was coming from the chimney. They knew something was wrong and they went in to see about this old lady. Listen, there were dark whispers as to the cause of her death. And there were those who testified to an expression of fear so exalted that it showed forth the state of the departing soul upon the dead face. See, there was those who testified to an expression of fear so exalted. Some people say that when you die, you're the last expression on your face like locks in like a death rictus. Um, certainly the rhyme of the ancient mariner, we can say that that happened, right? They all died with the evil eye and it stayed on their face. We just found out that this lady died. She was so afraid. She's like, ah, ah, and that look is still on her dead face. I'm not making that face again. Twice more. Ah, ah. All right, let's go on. 
The old woman had been hale and hearty when she entered the house, and in seven days she was dead. Guys, that's important. She had been hale and hearty when she entered the house, and in seven days she was dead. Hale and hearty means strong, virile, but yet seven days later she just died. Now, can that happen? Can somebody who's strong and alive just die within seven days? Sure. Does it happen often, though? Not really. It seemed that she had fallen victim to some uncanny power. I'm underlining that as well. Uncanny power. The minister talked in the pulpit with covert severity against the sin of superstition. Still, the belief prevailed. Not a soul in the village, but would have chosen the almshouse rather than that dwelling. The almshouse is where you keep dead people. So they said after that, people would rather go live in the, the dead people's house than go into that home over there. They'd rather spend a day with a bunch of dead people than go into that home. No vagrant, if he heard the tale, would seek shelter beneath that old roof, unhallowed by nearly a half a century of superstitious fear. So 50 years later, homeless people will not go into that place. Nobody will go into that home. Nobody, not the kids, not anybody. That tells you something. When little kids don't go into an abandoned home, there was only one person in the village who had actually known Loella Miller. That person was a woman well over 80, but a marvel of vitality and an unextinct youth. Straight as an arrow, with the spring of one recently let loose from the bow of life, she moved about the streets, and she always went to church, rain or shine. All right, so they're saying only one person had actually, that's still alive, had actually known Luella Miller. Remember, this happened 50 years ago, and they say that this woman is very strong, and also that she goes to church, always goes to church, rain or shine. Remember what we talked about, if a character in a vampire story is going to church, we know that that character is not a vampire. Now, could they be going to church, rain or shine, because they know that there's vampires out there? See, there's a flip side to that. Remember, this happened 50 years ago. And since that happened, this woman goes to church every day, all the time, no matter what the weather out. Is she doing it to protect herself from vampires? Let's continue. Or is she just very pious and religious? She had never married and had lived alone for years in a house across the road from Luella Miller's. This woman had none of the garrulousness of age, but never in all her life had she ever held her tongue for any will save her own, and she never spared the truth when she essayed to present it. Oh, okay, so basically she said this woman, she says her mind. If you ask her a question, she's going to answer it. She it was who bore testimony to the life, evil, though possibly wittingly or designedly so, of Luella Miller and to her personal appearance. So if you want to find out about Luella Miller, you go talk to this lady. And she, remember, she doesn't hold anything back. When this old woman spoke and she had the gift of description, although her thoughts were clothed in the rude vernacular of her native village, one could seem to see Luella Miller as she really looked. According to this woman, Lydia Anderson by her name, Luella Miller had been a beauty of a type rather unusual in New England. I'm going to underline that. She had been a beauty of a type rather unusual in New England. Now remember, especially from your cultural um, research, that a lot of the, the vampires from, from different cultures around the world and their historical vampires and their myths and legends have vampires as incredibly beautiful, right? A lot of them were women and they would draw people in with their sensuality and their sexuality, their beauty and their, their form, and then they would eat the people, right? So, but just because somebody's extraordinarily beautiful doesn't make them a vampire or a monster. Luella Miller had been a beauty of a type rather unusual in New England. She had been a slight, pliant sort of creature, as ready with a strong yielding to fate as an unbreakable as a willow. She had glimmering lengths of straight, fair hair, which she wore softly looped around a long, lovely face. She had blue eyes full of soft pleading, litter, sl little slender clinging hands, and a wonderful grace of motion and attitude. So nowhere in there did I read in her description, I said she's thin, she's beautiful, lovely face. She has a beautiful motion, so she moves very beautifully, but she's not described as vampiric as far as her looks and her movements. Although remember, vampires move very gracefully and right? very athletically. Okay. So Luella Miller used to sit in a way nobody else could if they sat up and studied a week of Sundays. What the heck does that mean? Luella Miller used to sit in a way nobody else could if they sat up and studied a week of Sundays. Something about her, her carriage, her bearing was different than anybody else. She sat different than anybody else, which is weird, but okay, said Lydia Anderson, and it was a sight to see her walk. If one of them willows over there on the edge of the brook could start up and get its roots free of the ground and move off, it would go just the way Luella Miller used to. So she walks 
like a tree. I'm not quite sure what that means. I mean, she says, if you saw that willow tree over there, lift up its roots and walk away, that's the way Loella Miller used to walk. I don't even know what that means. I'm going to underline it because it's weird, right? She could. She walks like a tree. I'm even going to put in my notes, walks like a tree with two question marks. What? Let's continue. She had a green shot silk she used to wear too and a hat with green ribbon streamers and a lace veil blowing across her face and out sideways and a green ribbon flying from her waist. That was what she had come out bride in when she had married Erastus Miller. Okay, so we're finding out some history. She married a guy named Erastus Miller. Her name before she was married was Hill. There was always a sight of L's in her name, married or single. Erastus Miller was good looking too, better looking than Luella. Sometimes I used to think that Luella wasn't so handsome after all. Arast is just about worship. All right, get that down right there. I underline, that's an underline. He just about worshiped her. Now that could have two meanings. One, he could just be like completely crushed and smitten on this woman. I've seen that happen before where guys completely worship the girls that they're into or vice versa. The girls completely worship the guys they're into. By the way, it's never a good thing. Worship somebody and they're going to get themselves a, a, a complex, right? They're going to think that they're better than you. But that's what he did. He worshiped her. Could it be? That he worships her because she has some kind of ESP, this power of mind or thought over him, the way vampires do. I don't know. Let's move on. Erastus just about worshipped her. I used to know him pretty well. He lived next door to me, and we went to school together. Folks used to say he was waiting on me, but he wasn't. I never thought he was except once or twice when he said things that some girls might have suspected meant something. That was before Loella came here to teach the district school. It was funny how she came to get it, too. For folks said she hadn't any education and that one of the big girls, Lottie Henderson, used to do all her teaching for her while she sat back and did embroidery work on a cambric pocket handkerchief. Wait, time out. So she got a job as teacher, even though she has no education. You're going to find that some of you teachers, you're going to wonder... Do these people ever go to school? So sometimes bad teachers slip through the cracks. We all know this. But the other weird thing about it, I mean, maybe because she was so pretty. You know, she got hired because some guy was hiring her and was like, I'll hire you. Maybe you'll you know, be very nice to me. And uh, you know, maybe I can hook up with you someday. Sometimes people get jobs that way. Um, but the weird thing is she got Lottie Henderson to do all her work for her. So this woman did all her work for her while she just sat in the background and did her knitting or whatnot. So she does no work. She lets other people do her work for her. Listen. Lottie Henderson was a real smart girl, a splendid scholar, and she just set her eyes by Luella, as all the girls did. Lottie would have made a would have made, wait a minute, would have made a real smart woman. But she died when Luella had been here about a year just faded away and died. Nobody knew what ailed her. So one year spending time with Luella Miller and this girl Lottie dies after one year for no reason. Why? Listen. She dragged herself to that schoolhouse and helped Luella teach till the very last minute. So even while she was dying, she still went in and helped this woman do her job. Now, <laughs> how fast are people that you know to get out of their work, right? What, any way they can, they'll get out of their work, right? But this girl who was dying fought, came in and continued to help this woman until she actually died. Listen, the committee all knew how Luella didn't do much of the work herself, but they winked at it. They let her get by. It wasn't long after Lottie died that Erastus married her. I always thought he hurried it up because she, she wasn't fit to teach. One of the big boys used to help her after Lottie died, but he hadn't much government and the school didn't do very well. And Luella might have had to give it up for the committee couldn't have shut their eyes to things much longer. The boy that helped her was a real honest and innocent sort of fella. And he was a good scholar, too. Folks said he overstudied. And that was the reason he took crazy the year after Luella Miller. But I don't know. OK, so after... Lottie comes in and helps her for a year, and she just ups and dies. Then another boy comes in and helps her for about a year, and he doesn't die, but he goes crazy, nuts, and he's out of the picture as well. Seems to me that anybody who gets close to Luella Miller goes crazy or dies. Listen. And I don't know what made Erastus Miller go into consumption of the blood the year after he was married. Consumption wasn't in his family. He just grew weaker and weaker and went almost bent double when he went and tried to wait on Luella. And he spoke feeble like an old man. He worked terrible hard to the last.
save up a little to leave Luella. I've seen him out in the worst streams on a wood sled. He used to cut and sell wood, and he was hunched up on top looking more dead than alive. So a year with being married to Luella, and he gets consumption of the blood and dies. So he kind of wastes away as well. And he was a strong man as well. And another strange thing, he works for her up until the minute he dies. He doesn't go and rest or try to get himself healthy. No, he stays with her until he dies. It's almost as if he and all of them are under some kind of weird power to continue to help this woman, even though it's killing them. Listen. Once I couldn't stand it, I went over and helped him pitch some wood onto the cart. I was always strong in my arms. I wouldn't stop for all he told me to, and I guess he was glad enough for the help. That was only a week before he died. He fell on the kitchen floor while he was getting breakfast. He always got the breakfast and let Luella lay a bed. OMG. He gets her breakfast in bed and did every day. Even when he was dying, the week he died, he still brought her breakfast in bed. Now, you would think that if this Luella Miller, his loving wife, really loved him, would she want him to keep working so hard while he was clearly dying and sick? No, she said, baby, baby, get in bed. Let me take care of you. But that doesn't occur. No, no, she lets him wait on her until he dies. He did all the sweeping and the washing and the ironing and most of the cooking. He couldn't bear to have Luella lift her finger and she let him do for her. She lives like a queen for all the work she did. She didn't even do her sewing. She said it made her shoulders ache to sew. And poor Erastus' sister Lily used to do all her sewing. She wasn't able to either. She was never strong in her back, but she did it beautifully. She had to, to suit Luella. She was so dreadful particular. I never saw anything like the faggoted and hemstitching that Lily Miller did for Luella. She made all Luella's wedding outfit and that green silk dress after Maria Babbitt cut it. Maria, she cut it for nothing, and she did a lot more cutting and fitting for nothing for Luella too. Lily Miller went to live with Luella after Erastus died. Wait a minute, stop, go back. The lady who does the, the cutting of the, the fabrics in the, in the town, the seamstress, she, it says Miller cut nothing, and she did a lot more cutting and fitting for nothing for Luella, too. So she gives Luella all free stuff. Is she rich enough to do that? No, of course. She's under Luella's spell as well. She went to live, uh, and then Lily Miller went to live with Luella after Erastus died. She gave up her home, although she was real attached to it and wasn't a mite afraid to stay alone. She rented it, and she went to live with Luella right away after the funeral. So the minute Erastus dies, boom, she Luella goes to the sister and says, you come live with me now. You take care of me now as well. And the woman does. I have read way too long. I was only supposed to read two pages, and here I am on my fourth page. I'm going to stop right there, and you're going to finish these last six or seven pages. Pay close attention to what happens to all the people that go near Luella Miller. Also find out what happens to Luella Miller at the end. I'm very interested to hear that. Um, is this a vampire story? Um, and if, if so, what type of vampire story would you call this? If it's not a vampire story, tell me why, of course, for three reasons and three quotes. And of course, there's the old, if you want, you can tell me that you believe it's not a vampire story, but there's three reasons why people might think that it is. So of course, you're going to fill out your vampire story page. Enjoy the rest of the story and have a lovely day.